So I'm here today to talk to you about designing for exponentials. So if you're like me, you've had your mind blown over the past few days, and you're saying, OK, that's some crazy stuff. Now what? What do I do? Well, one thing that you may have noticed about these exponential technologies is that they obliterate assumptions. What do I mean by that? Well, if you looked at Peter Diamantis' example of uh, Kodak, it's one of his quintessential examples, right? What it did, what digital photography did, was completely destroy the assumption that photographs are physical objects. Self-driving cars, they obliterate the assumption that humans need to drive. Well, how do you figure out what assumptions are there, what things are there? Because you know what happens as experts? The better you get at your industry and your field, the less likely you are to even understand what assumptions you're making, right? There's this old adage that if all you, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, we get so great at our jobs that we don't think about the problem anymore. We start thinking about better solutions to that problem. And that's where the problem lies, right? Is that we start making assumptions about what the problem is that we're solving and focus more on the solutions or focus more about how to make things within our company or within our industry. And then some novice comes in who doesn't care at all about best practices or about what your industry has done for hundreds of years, and they do it completely different and knock your company out. Okay, so what do you do? Have you ever asked um, a question, like so yesterday a friend of mine asked me, why do cars all look the same? They knew I worked on cars, and they wanted to know, why? Why do they all look the same? Yeah, OK, so the Jaguar looks different than a Ford, but they're both made by Ford, ultimately. And they all have you know, similar placement of doors, similar place where the engine sits, four wheels, right? gas tank on a certain side so that it can plug in. Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. One is the infrastructure. Like I said, the gas tank, the gas nozzle has to fit into the right spot on the gas tank, so it has to be in a certain spot. It has to be a certain size. The four wheels on the car. There's the whole manufacturing process of interchangeable parts, right, that are sourced from all over the world. That's what the whole point of the manufacturing line. Then we have the chassis, right? They make one chassis, and they make three different body models on it. Sure, OK, so we can blame it on that. But it's not just that. If you want to design cars, you go to one of two schools. You go for College of Creative Studies, where I graduated from, my alma mater, or you go to Art Center in Los Angeles. These are the two schools you go to. Even if you're a Japanese car designer or a German car designer, those are the schools you've gone to. And they've indoctrinated you into a certain way of thinking, a certain way of thinking about cars, about car design. And it makes you think of those things, make those assumptions about making cars. To get outside of those assumptions, you have to shift your perspective. You have to look at the situation from a completely different angle. And when you do, you start to see exactly what assumptions you're making that are no longer relevant. How many of you have heard of the allegory of the cave, Plato's allegory of the cave? OK, no problem. So those of you that don't know, here's how it goes. There's prisoners, and they are chained up in a cave. And they are facing the wall of the cave, not the exit of the cave, but the wall of the cave. And occasionally, animals or birds or people will walk by the entrance, and they'll see the shadows projected. Now, these people have never been outside, so they think that the outside world is all this crazy shadow creatures. They're scared of it. One day, a man breaks free, and he escapes the cave. And he goes outside, and he is blown away. There's real people, there's animals, there's all this beautiful stuff out there. And he feels so strongly about it that he runs back to captivity to tell his friends about it. And none of them believe him. In fact, they're really angry at him. They just don't believe that that's true. They have these assumptions, and he is breaking it. He is not following the rules. So it's really important to push yourselves to see things from another perspective, to break your assumptions. How do you do that? At SU Labs, we've developed something called Design for Exponentials, or D4X. And the whole purpose of it is to comp constantly push you to change your perspective on the problem, on the questions that you're asking, to see things from different eyes. 
And in doing so, you'll unveil all the assumptions that you have been taking for granted about that industry or that problem space. There's three steps to it. One is discover, then we project, and then we make. Let me tell you about these. First is discover. And you'll frequently hear this in a, in a lot of design processes. It's called research. research. But we do it a little bit differently because we uh, are SU. <laughs> so the key to this is that you can't solve these problems by sitting in, this, in, in your uh, office. That's not where the problem lies. I can guarantee that your biggest challenge is not sitting at your desk. Your biggest challenge is somewhere else. And you're sitting at your desk thinking about it. So you have to go there. You have to go there. You have to immerse yourself in the problem and really look at the problem the actual problem. Because you'll start to see that some of the things that you're worrying about back in your office are completely irrelevant in the reality. This happens all the time. The next is to listen to other voices. All right, I want you to look around the room right now. Are you seeing anything slightly homogenous about the group of people sitting here, right? Majority male, there's some women in the audience, but we're all from you know, the quote unquote developed world. We all have a certain type of view on the world and the way things should work. We have been indoctrinated into a whole system of thinking of how things work and expectations around that. There's a really easy way to shake up your thinking, and that is to talk to other people. Listen to other voices, people that aren't traditionally at your table, not traditionally invited into your conference room. Go other places. That's what happens when we look at how uh, you know, India and, and uh, Africa has completely leapfrogged uh, the way that cell services are used, right? They use the cell phone in a completely different way than we ever thought of doing in the US. China, you can have things delivered to your phone, not to your home, but to your phone, which is much more effective because then I could order you know, from Amazon wherever I am in the world and it'll show up where I'm at, not waiting for me at home, but where I'm at. Right? We talked, um, uh, Neil told you about the pizza that delivers to your shoes. That's great, right? They're doing things that we would never think of doing with technology. And it can be brought back into developed worlds to do all kinds of crazy stuff. Talk to women. There's a lot of women that aren't <laughs> at your tables, and they're really good people to listen to. There was a, um, a heart um, tool that was developed for cardiologists that really, really had a huge impact on, on uh, cardiovascular health. The problem is, is it was developed all by men. It was tested all on men. Guess what? Doesn't work on women at all. Not at all. Doesn't help them. So basically, they've just lost half the population that they could be servicing and making money off of, but they're not. Then work on impact, right? We have a series of global grand challenges, 13 of them, I think, at the last count. And when you go and you work on those problems, yeah, they're not money makers to begin with, but they will lead to money making eventually. And also, you're solving some major problem. That's a good thing. That's exactly what SRI did when they developed the acoustic modem. They were trying to help deaf people to talk on the phone. So they created this acoustic modem so that people could send text messages over the phone. And that led to the commercialization of the internet. All those dial-up modems, the that's an acoustic modem. So they worked on this one edge case, and it brought back huge benefits to the rest of the world. The same thing happened with Made in Space. This is an SU company, Made in Space. You may have heard about them around here. They're a 3D printing company, and they created the first 3D printer on the International Space Station. And by working on that extreme environment, they had to come up with all kinds of solutions from how to recycle parts, how to deal with off-gassing, in a way that they would never have even dealt with on the planet Earth. But now they have all these really valuable patents that they're brought back to the planet Earth and are leveraging here on, on our planet. And then I want you to challenge you to look elsewhere. Look at things that are completely opposite of what you're doing. So biomimicry is a, a really good example. Biomimicry looks at natural systems and then uses them, takes them back to influence um, uh, what you're doing in, in your industry. This is uh, actually a industrial park. What they did was they looked at a closed, uh, at an um, echo ecosystem. So they were looking at a, um, a 
I think it was a, a nature preserve. And what they noticed is that every animal's offput was actually input for another creature or another, or another species growing in that environment. And so they created an industrial park where every um, company's off-gassing or off-waste uh, product becomes input to the next company. Um, and then that company's waste becomes input to the next company. So there's zero waste in this complex. And it actually becomes very efficient and very cost-effective. Okay, so you can look at examples from nature, from other places, and bring them back to your own industry to make huge gains. Okay, so the second step is projection. And by that I mean science fiction. Science fiction is a very, very powerful tool for developing exponential solutions. We've been using it for generations without even knowing it. Over and over again, science fiction has influ influenced science fact because geeks like myself we go, we read the science fiction books, we watch the science fiction movies, and uh, you go back to your desk and you try to make that real. And we do. And then it becomes science fact. And then science fiction readers see that, or writers see that, and they go, oh, that makes me think of this. And they write science fiction, and then I want to go and make that real, and it happens over and over again. We saw that happen with Hal, who influenced Siri. We saw it happen, uh, we're seeing it happen at Oculus Rift where every new employee gets handed a copy of Ready Player One, a science fiction novel about the future of virtual, in virtual reality. We are seeing it happen, play out right now at XPRIZE, where they are being inspired by the tricorder. The tricorder is the device that's, that um, the doctor uses to scan people and get their bio status. Well, XPRIZE, Qualcomm, uh, the, uh, XPRIZE and Qualcomm have teamed up to make the tricorder prize. And it's being developed. There's two finalists right now. It's Pretty cool stuff, right? So science fiction can be leveraged to help you to imagine what's going to happen when these exponential technologies fully reach maturity. Because right now you look at them and they're not quite up to speed, right? I'm an expert in augmented reality and if, if somebody were to say right now, you know, I want to use augmented reality, well the reality of today's devices is nowhere near what it's going to be like in two or five years when your product actually hits the marketplace. So we, have, um, we really strongly encourage our, our partners to write their own science fiction. And we've developed this process called Sci-Fi DI that helps them do just that. First, we start by imagining the future, not about your industry, but just the future at large when these technologies mature. How are they going to impact the world at large? And then we focus on how your business will change as a result of that. What will your role be in that world? To give you an example, I just did this with Airbus. Airbus apparently is a very popular uh, <laughs> group on this stage today. So we just did this with uh, Airbus around the future of learning. And um, we had them imagine the world in 2030. What will it be like? What's going to happen with artificial intelligence and augmented reality in that world? And how will we be using it in everyday life? And then we had them craft an example of what Airbus will be doing with those technologies to um, create learning for their employees. Then we retrocast from there. That's the future we want? Then what do we need to start building? And when do those things need to start hitting the marketplace in order for us to actually make this thing real? And then we build a prototype. And we start getting the partners in place so that in a year or two years' time, we can get stuff out there that we really want, not just from ourselves, but from our partners. Okay? The last, and that brings us to our last phase, which is make. Right? Making is incredibly important. And you don't have to go fancy like I just did with that um, Airbus prototype. Right? We, can, we can start with just some really basic things. That's what Tom Chi talks about a lot. Tom Chi um, is one of the guys from Google Prototyping X. He uh, famously created, uh, prototyped the, the Google Glass with uh, just some coat wires and some fishing line and some projectors. Nothing expensive. Really, really cheap. Just to try it out, to see what would happen, to see what they should be building. This reduced the cost of development because they were able to fail fast and learn rapidly what works and what doesn't. And that's not the only benefit. You also find a whole new opportunity. We as humans, we think with our whole body, not just our brain. 
We can't just sit there and come up with ideas. We actually have to engage the body in thought. How many times have you been stuck on a problem and you go for a walk and suddenly you have the answer? Right? Happens all the time. When kids are stuck on a math problem, if we tell them to use their fingers and their toes, <laughs> suddenly they solve the math problem a lot better. Not just because they have a practical example, but because they've engaged the body into the thinking process. So embodied cognition comes out when you start to make things in a very physical way. The other thing that happens is that you unleash your creativity. Because that gluing together and the paper clips and the whatever crazy things you're doing is a lot more like playing than it is like working, you engage your childlike wonder, your creativity, and all kinds of ideas that you would have thought ludicrous a few hours ago suddenly come out and you realize how valuable they actually are. So engage your body in your thinking. Here is how I prototyped a bunch of uh, stuff for HoloLens. I was one of the principal designers on HoloLens. And I used some paper, some tape, some glue, and I made these dioramas out of, um, out of uh, mylar to show what might happen if we start to think about physical or physically interacting with our technology, our virtual technology. And it was very beneficial. It helped me not only to think through my ideas, but then it also helped me when I was talking to engineers saying, this is what I want to build. When I tried to describe it on a piece of paper, they didn't understand. But when I handed them one of these dioramas, they were like, oh, I get that. Yeah, sure, we can make that. So the whole idea behind this process is to constantly create different frameworks for you to think about the problem. And you'll notice that every time, every one of these steps gives you a different perspective, a different way of thinking about the problem that naturally makes you disregard your assumptions and to rethink the problem in a different way. And that's really what you want to do. So I guess what I'm trying to um, encourage here is for you to get up out of your seats and to do these things. Do or do not, there is no try, as Yoda says. And I think you can all do this. Thank you. <laughs>